Hello, everyone. Welcome to this PDC Flow sponsored webinar featuring Mary Shores, the Goldilocks Zone of Connection, teaching collectors to find the middle ground in communication. My name is Dawn Updike. I am the marketing manager here at PDC Flow. And I wanted to give you just a little bit of information about PDC Flow before I hand the webinar time over to Mary. PDC Flow is consumer engagement software for organizations that want to eliminate friction and effectively engage consumers. With all the technology available today, consumers have come to expect easy, modern product and service experiences. Whether a person is paying a bill, signing a contract, or transferring documents with sensitive information, they want a secure, simple, and user-friendly experience. Our flow technology gives organizations the ability to deliver and capture secure payments, documents, e-signatures, and photo uploads in one seamless workflow. And with our flexible templates, you can build transaction delivery workflows to meet your individual compliance and business requirements. If you'd like more information on how PDC flow can help you reduce risk, minimize PCI compliance, and collect payments faster, please contact us at sales at pdcflow.com. Um, moving on to our disclaimer, the information presented is not legal advice. PDC Flow is a technology company and we provide this information solely for genera general informational purposes. You are responsible for your organization's actions and compliance efforts. As always, if you have any questions about compliance, you should consult your own attorney. Time to introduce our presenter. Mary is a second generation agency owner, best-selling author, and creator of the Collection Advantage Online Program. This program is designed to help collectors create and execute high converting scripts. In this webinar, she's going to focus specifically on how collectors can find that middle ground in communications, finding that balance between being empathetic and aggressive so your collectors can secure the payment and the consumer can end the call feeling heard and satisfied with the outcome. We have reserved the last 15 minutes of the webinar to answer the questions you submitted via the survey form we emailed you. And we are recording this webinar and we'll share the link with you once the recording is available. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to you, Mary. Thank you so much, Dawn. I am so excited to get started today. So welcome to the Goldilocks Zone of Connection. Today we're talking about teaching collectors to find the middle ground in communication. My name is Mary Shores and I don't know about you, but lately I've been thinking about how much has changed in the United States this year of 2020. On one hand, we're seeing a lot of regulatory shakeup or clients who may have asked us to pause our efforts. And on the other hand, I'm having so many agencies share with me that they're, they're reporting higher than average, and in some cases, higher than ever recovery due to the stimulus package. I believe wholeheartedly, we are in an era of major change in our culture, which will absolutely affect our industry. Since 2005, I have been consuming everything I could get my hands on regarding empathy, compassion, and how to create human connection, which led me to neuroscience and eventually a best-selling book called Conscious Communications. And more recently, I have developed the online training program called the Collection Advantage Program, which is specifically de designed to be a blueprint to create high converting collectors. In this webinar, in this webinar, we're going to learn how to avoid the friend zone and the conflict zone. And most importantly, I'll be sharing secrets I've found that can have a dramatic effect on your agency's bottom line by finding that sweet spot of the Goldilocks zone. So it's not too hot not too cold, it's just right. And I hope you stay tuned until the end because as Dawn mentioned, we're gonna answer those questions that you guys sent in, but I also would love to do a communication makeover, which just means you tell me what the problem is and I am going to give you a workable solution. So make sure you stay tuned until the end. 
All right. Are your collectors stuck in the friend zone with consumers? Um, one thing I want to mention to you is that we have created this handout. So all of you will receive this as a companion piece that goes along with the webinar. So within about a day or two, you'll be receiving this document in your inbox. So are your collectors stuck in the friend zone with consumers? In other words, are your collectors sympathetic to the consumers to the point where they actually feel bad for payment and don't collect any money or only a small amount? Or sometimes it's the opposite problem. Have you ever like, have you ever cringed at the thought of sharing some of your call recordings with clients because of the unprofessionalism or bad behavior from your collectors? You know, maybe they were overly aggressive and that just lands them directly in that conflict zone. You know, clients right now are having concerns about out, outsourcing their debt recovery. Let me tell you a little story. The other day, I decided to sit in on a sales meeting for my agency, which actually I haven't done that in quite a long time. But for some reason, I just really wanted to be in on this call. Plus, it was on Zoom, which meant I didn't have to leave my house. And I really like not leaving the house. So anyway, I'm on the call with these guys and I asked them, what are their roadblocks or concerns when it comes to working with a collection agency? And and they told me they recently had to fire two agencies. One of the agencies they fired because their recoveries were too low. So on a positive note, the organization wasn't getting any complaints coming from the patients, this was a hospital, about the agency and they really liked that. But the recoveries just were not there. And then the second agency they told me about, it was actually the opposite challenge. Their recoveries were decent and so were the number of complaints coming in, meaning there was way too many patient complaints about this particular agency. So the high recoveries combined with low patient satisfaction just wasn't worth it in the end. So the expectation is keeping patients happy and limiting complaints, it is important just that it cannot be at the cost of recoveries. So I'm actually gonna stop sharing for a second and just come on camera because I wanna tell you what happened next. Okay, so I'm in the sales meeting and I'm talking to these guys and I immediately said, I know what happened. I said those, that agency that you're using and they're not getting very great recoveries, but you're not getting any client or any um, recoveries either, it's because those collectors are stuck in the friend zone, meaning that they're using passive language and you're not getting the complaints, it, you're just not getting recoveries either. And then the other piece of that was that the collectors that were too aggressive, they were in the conflict zone. I said, you need to be in that sweet spot. And honestly, I just held up this manual and I told them how I, I shared how I train collectors with empathy and compassion. And honestly, they just signed up right away. So, okay, I'm gonna turn my camera back off and share the screen once again. All right. Took a lot of courage, you guys, there for me to go <laughs> on that camera for a second. So in order to establish credibility in the new normal, one of the most important keys is in how you are going to plan to keep your clients safe and secure. They may be concerned over negative public relations with accounts that they place in collections. They may be concerned about those complaints that are coming in. The next thing is they want assurance that you as an agency are able to stay ahead of the curve with the coming changes. What they expect is for you to be proactive by calibrating new strategies that will keep them having high recoveries and low complaints. The great news here is that I believe they will be willing to pay higher fees for this white glove level of service. So this new hospital client, now they're a small hospital, but they are actually onboarding at a higher commission rate because 
And, and, and in the end, they told me that it was well worth it. So just to let you know what they were expecting was something around the 19 and a half percent range. And I signed them at 24%. So just kind of want to throw that out there. All right. After listening, you know, I really told them how we structure our um, agents, how we train them. And the thing is that the friend zone, it's a problem because the call doesn't move forward and it often just ends without any payment plan or any plan at all for that matter, other than collectors agreeing to check back in with them in a couple of weeks, only to repeat the same conversation over and over and over again. The friend zone sets a collector up for failure. This can happen when collectors are sympathetic to the point that they actually now feel bad about asking for money, especially now when daily life is evolving in challenging ways. So what is the friend zone? It's those passive collectors, they get in the friend zone because their language is nice and sympathetic, which is a plus because the consumer finds no reason to complain. The problem is that this kind of connection makes it very difficult for collectors to ask for money or use a direct action statement because of the way they feel. This, is be this can um, easily become uncomfortable talking about debt and oftentimes the collector gets tongue tied because they just don't know what to say. Basically the call goes cold, it doesn't move forward, and it certainly doesn't result in payment. So the friend zone happens because collectors oftentimes confuse concepts such as empathy versus sympathy. Also, there's a lot of pressure on our frontline collectors to be kind, compassionate, and friendly. I feel strongly that we need to teach our teams how to communicate effectively because it's not enough to just say, be empathetic, we need to show them how they can build their communication skills through training that is geared towards high converting scripting. Years ago, whenever I was training new collectors, I often noticed how much fear and anxiety they had over asking people for money. Now, this was true whether I was training them at my agency or if I was training them for my clients. I actually called this the fear of the freak out. And if you have ever had a new collector leave after the first few days and never return, I am willing to bet they were uncomfortable at the very thought of asking people for money. So I've heard story after story like, you know, employees that would have to run to the bathroom because they literally felt sick over it. So the reality is, and this is a really big reality, that collectors have three real fears, beginning with the fear of the freak out. My reps were so terrified to ask for money because they were afraid of getting an emotional outburst from the consumer. This freak out happens when consumers feel overly frustrated about their situation and when they don't feel heard and understood, they can become frustrated to the point that they blow up and take it out on the collector. I've always said that everything you say is either going to, I sometimes refer to this as cleanse or clog, meaning everything you say, every word is either cleansing the situation or clogging it. Meaning that when we're speaking to consumers, we're either moving them down a frequency scale of emotions because we have triggered their fight or flight reaction. I also noticed that there can be a tendency to have a, a fear of being mean or a fear of feel, uh, feeling guilty. So this comes up a lot um, because asking for money can feel awful, like you yourself are a bad person. It's like there's this little voice in your head that might feel sorry for the consumer and you start to take it personally. I see this as a common fear, especially if the collector themselves has struggled with debt in their own personal life, and especially if they've watched their parents or other close relatives take collection calls when they were young, because now that is affecting their confidence level in asking for payment. Another one of the fears that I have noticed is just fear of not knowing what to say or what to do. 
So it feels really awkward. There's nothing worse than not knowing what to say and your voice starts to crack a little bit. Or another thing that happens is collectors will start to talk really fast and Oftentimes, and this is kind of a sad reality in our industry, but how many times have you listened to a collection call and the collector just never even actually ever asked for payment? The collector's voice is one of the most powerful assets an agency has, and it's often the least invested in. We train them on compliance. We train them on how to use our various systems and technology. We train them on our policies and procedures and even our policies and procedures of our clients. And when it comes to training them on the phone, likely they're going to shadow a veteran collector and try to clone whomever they shadowed, which on one hand, they can pick up some great tips and tricks. And also though, it can result in picking up some bad habits right from day one. These kind of fears cause your collectors to speak passively to a consumer. They may avoid asking for payment, speaking in circles subconsciously, waiting for the consumer to interrupt them and offer a payment or just end the phone call. Another way I've seen collectors become passive is to say phrases like, is there any way you can make this payment today? Now, we all know that obviously that is not the correct way to ask for payment because it's a passive closed ended question. And in this case, whenever I hear someone say, is there any way you could make the payment today? The answer is always no. I also noticed with a former employee, her name's Jennifer. Jennifer is actually a great team member and she was studying law enforcement at the time, working towards a degree. She had one big problem on the phone and this to me, uncovered her own subconscious feelings about asking for money. So what she would do is she would ask for payment, but she would interject a long or right in the middle. So she would say, is there any way you can pay this account today? Or, and she would honestly stretch that or out until the consumer interrupted her to request a payment arrangement. She would feel so much relief in that moment because she was just more comfortable setting the consumer up on monthly payments. And this is an example of someone who's allowing their own feelings, which are very, very valid, to affect their job performance. It is so difficult to go against our own moral judgment. Once collectors have recovered from their fears for asking for large sums of money, can I go one? Once collectors have recovered from these fears for asking for large sums of money, they we want to get them set up on the best possible arrangement. Sorry guys, I got a little bit off. So before we move on to talking about the Goldilocks zone, I did want to talk a little bit about what in, lands you in the conflict zone. So one of the things that happens in the conflict zone is oftentimes collectors can inadvertently use language that feels threatening to the consumer. What I mean by that is that they're talking in terms of consequences instead of solutions. Another thing that causes them to get into this conflict zone is when they're making making argumentative statements, which is very subtle. So to them, it just is that they're disagreeing or that failure to acknowledge that the cons what the consumer has said. There's also sometimes an insinuation of guilt, which just means that implying that the consumer situation is their fault. And then lastly, it's that use of negative language. It oftentimes feels feels like the consumer and the collector are just in a boxing ring together. If you want to know more about the conflict zone, I actually did a previous webinar in June that was called um, Collections in the Face of, the a Face of a Crisis, and that is available on YouTube. My assistant, Tashel, can put that link in the chat box for you. That was a really great webinar. All right, so let's talk about that sweet spot. The sweet spot is the Goldilocks zone of an arrangement. It's not too high, meaning the consumer just gave you a counterfeit yes. 
okay just to get you off the phone and it's not too low meaning that the account is not going to take forever to pay it off so the goldilocks zone is that that sweet spot of the arrangement it's the right arrangement that stretches the consumer just enough to get the count account paid in the fastest way possible and yet they can still afford it comfortably trust me we are not doing the consumer any favors by stretching out that payment for years it's so much better for them to rip it off like a band-aid because now the consumer is not thinking about it anymore and they can simply move on you know you're in the goldilocks zone when a connection is made because the consumer and the collector are both calm the call is moving forward and the reason it's moving forward forward is because we have been able to create that connection that just allows things to flow. And the most important thing is that a promise is made or an arrangement has been established in that sweet spot of the Goldilocks zone. So it's not too high that they're going to skip payments or they're going to avoid your phone calls. And it's not too low, meaning that it's going to take forever, but the payment arrangement is just right to get it paid off in a reasonable amount of time. So what I discovered is the secret lies in two fundamental and key components, which are understanding both the consumer fears and the fears and frustrations of the collectors. So interestingly enough, I was thinking about this last night because I was um, hiking, which is quickly become like my favorite pastime uh, because of, um, you know, quarantine. And sometimes when I'm hiking in the woods, I get these little cockaburls stuck on my favorite colorful yoga, pa yoga pants. And I think debt can feel that way, you know, like it's just stuck on you and you have to pluck it out one by one. 15 years ago, I was so exhausted from the daily stressful phone calls. And I really just one day looked at the phone and I said out loud, I want the next person who calls to be happy by the end of the call, happier than they were when we first started the call. So I had no idea how I was gonna do that, but I decided to make a little lab experiment out of my agency's call center. So the first thing that I did was to eliminate negative language. So I created a do not say list. Now the main words on the do not say list are no, not, can't, won't, however, and unfortunately. So just by eliminating negative words alone, okay? So you guys can all do this. Just by eliminating these words off this do not say list, our revenue skyrocketed. Within one year, it went up 34%. Now, this is because negative words plant a seed of a negative outcome. And also science has now discovered when you put participants into an MRI machine and subject them to negative words, the consequence and the punishment center of the brain is actually what is activated and lights up. So for my next experiment, I needed to figure out what to replace the negative language with. And that is when I discovered the power of empathy, which essentially is the way to create a connection of trust and rapport while increasing your revenue and making the consumer feel better about the fact that they're paying a debt instead of sitting in the shame and unworthiness of having a debt. So the first step here is that you always want to train your collectors on how to use validation phrases. The number one emotional need is to feel heard and understood. It's like we have a checklist in our mind and we can't move on in a conversation until we have actually checked that box that we have felt heard and understood. So if someone is on the phone and they're telling your collector a long story, or maybe some of you have encountered this like with a friend or a relative or your partner, where it's like someone is just telling this story on repeat. It can feel so frustrating to you to listen to this person stay stuck in their story. But the truth is, if this is happening, it's because they don't feel heard and understood. So the best way to get them to move on in a conversation is to acknowledge their concerns. So you can do this by saying, I completely understand. I see why you would be concerned. 
Now, here's the thing. The biggest mistake I see with, with reps, and it doesn't matter if it's like, you know, they're a collection agent or if it's a customer service situation, is that they'll say, I completely understand your situation. Unfortunately, you still owe this money. Or I understand how you feel, but we need to talk about this debt. I understand how you feel. However, so here's what I'm trying to say, that if you say the acknowledgement, if you use a validation phrase, but then you follow it up with one of those words on the do not say list, and I'm here to tell you right now that the biggest offender on that list is the word unfortunately, because, because negative words plant a seed of a negative outcome. And whenever you use one of the words on the do not say list after a validation phrase, then you have just basically negated everything that you said ahead of that. So we just want to make sure that we're doing it the correct way, moving the call forward. And then the way you do that is you follow up your validation phrase immediately with a seed of happiness. So a seed of happiness is just a few words spoken at the right time. And what it does is it creates a bridge from the first step, which is validation, and the last step, which is using an action statement to tell the consumer what you can do, or what we call talking in, talking in terms of solutions. It's so frustrating when you're reaching out for help and you're talking to someone and all they're doing is telling you everything that they cannot do for you. So when we put this together, it can look like, you know, I can completely understand your concerns. If I were in your situation, I would likely feel the same way. The good news is we have plenty of options to meet your needs. Or the good news is we can set you up on an arrangement, you know, whatever, whatever is that solution. And it's going to be different in every single case. So this is actually how you demonstrate empathy and still collect money. Whenever you leverage the power of empathy, your bottom line will skyrocket because um, in order to achieve that result, the first step is to change our mindset. And that's exactly what happened with Jose Castro, the site manager at Capital Accounts. He said that when he first got started with our program, it truly changed their entire team's mindset on how they work together with consumers to be able to achieve those results of collecting money and create that connection. Carol Rudy from Central Credit Audit had a very similar result saying she was really surprised how you can calm down a consumer with one simple phrase. So this is very different than learning the um, traditional sort of de-escalation techniques. So another way to increase your revenue is to examine your negotiations. I see a lot of money being left on the table when collectors set consumers up on arrangements that are typically less, less than $50 a month. So one of the ways that this happens is that you're talking to a consumer and they'll throw out a low ball payment arrangement offer. So maybe they'll say like, oh, I can pay $25 a month or I can pay $30 a month. And what was happening in my office is that the collectors would always respond by saying something like, no, I'm sorry. Unfortunately, we don't collect or we don't accept $30 a month payments. And then immediately they were trying to take that $30 and go up. So one of the most important strategies that collectors learn in the Collection Advantage online training program is to always negotiate from the top down instead of from the bottom up. So what we want to do is when that consumer says, oh, I can pay you $30 a month, we want to teach the collectors to say, let's go ahead and update your information so we can discuss your options. That's a really great opportunity to start to capture all of that demographic information and then say, what I can do for you is to split this up into two monthly payments or three monthly payments. You know, you always want to start with like a set of payment guidelines. The bottom line here is that we always want to develop high converting collectors who negotiate with the to create that highest possible arrangement and in the end find the sweet spot of the Goldilocks zone. So some of the results that we're seeing that that are going through the collection advantage training program is 
close rates increasing by 30% on average with actually 40% overall increased recoveries. And the real miracle happens with new hires because new hires are special, right? And if you bring in new hires and train them in a different way, instead of training them the, the old way. And I, I kind of think about here, it's like, a lot of collection strategies were built in the baby boomer mindset, meaning that we built strategies and talk offs around the concept of pride and responsibility. Right now, though, we're in the millennial era, and this is so important because in the millennial era, people make decisions based on how they feel. And so if you can grab your new hires, train them with these strategies, you can increase what they bring in immediately. So one of my clients, they have an expectation that new collectors collect $2,000 within the first two weeks. So that's a week of training. And then the second week they're on the phone, they brought in a team of four people. So they should have brought in $8,000. That team brought in $48,000 within two weeks. They were all brand new hires. Only one of those four people had any collection experience. Um, one of them, they, they told me they even hired out of the Hardee's drive-through. That is a six time return or higher than the average. So empathy has been the buzzword in business this year and for good reason. A company without compassion, I don't think is gonna last very long um, in this environment. And as I've illustrated, it's not just enough to tell team members to be empathetic. You really have to show them how. And you have to show them how to balance being empathetic and still collecting the, the payment. So all of this serves to say, invest in your collector's voice, provide communication training, have a strategy and a process in place so that at the end of the day, every collector is communicating this way on every call, right? Every collector, every time, everywhere. Clients no longer just want to read on your website that your practices are empathetic and compassionate collections. They're going to want assurance. So I've already had some agencies reaching out to me saying their clients are actually requiring them to provide some type of specialized sensitivity training. The great news here is that this will pay off because according to Chris Foss, who is um, first of all, the number one hostage negotiator in the world, also the author of Never Split the Difference, says that people are six times more likely to make a deal with someone if they actually like you. So we do want to let you know that, again, you're going to get that free handout. And right now, I would love to get started on the questions. Also, if you have other questions or if you have, whether it's a personal communication situation or any type of, you know, place that you're stuck, please just um, let me know because I am happy to help. All right, Don, right. are you ready? I am. So we mailed out a survey, emailed a survey to everybody that registered, and we had several topics or areas um, for you to ask Mary about. And the first one was around the communication challenges that your collectors are experiencing today. So the question, one of the questions that came in around this topic was to Mary was, how are you, Mary, dealing with COVID-related hardships? So several things, and um, I really appreciate this question. You know, there's so many things going on with COVID, right? So we had to do everything from moving all of our, you know, staff to be able to work from home. Um, but when it comes to communication and COVID, this is a great time also to refer back to that other webinars. So if you're the person who asked this question, I would definitely grab that link and watch that webinar on YouTube because the way that we do this is we want to open up the conversation with empathy and by asking what I call um, a calibrated question. So one of the great questions that works, especially with COVID hardship, is to say, how are you feeling about dot, dot, dot? Now you fill in the dot, dot, dot with whatever is the elephant in the room. Okay, how are you feeling about your finances over the next few weeks? 
Now you need to pause, okay, psychological pause. We all know how to do that. And then you need to let the consumer respond however they're going to respond. Once the consumer responds, you know, now you know you can follow it up with that validation phrase. The validation phrase that we've been using for COVID is, you know, thank you for, so we ask them, how are you feeling about your finances? Okay, and then they respond. And I might say something like, thank you for sharing that. So many other people are telling us the exact same thing. So you are not alone. Now, interestingly enough, you are not alone is the number one high converting phrase in online marketing. So, you know, all those Facebook ads that you see that is really geared to the concept of making people feel like they're not alone. This is a great way to bring humanity back into the process. So th this phrase is going to be right on this document that we're going to be emailing you in another couple of days, but really it's about asking that feeling question. Now, if you're not, if you're not comfortable saying the word feeling because some people aren't, you can say, what are your thoughts about your finances over the next few weeks? Now, I know this may seem counterintuitive and I am telling you though, it really works to create connection and you will get a lot of recoveries that you wouldn't otherwise expect to get. Okay. All right, Don, back to you. All right, so the next area or topic was the communication challenges that you may be experiencing with your clients. We had, um, you know, more questions come in under that topic. Mm -hmm. The first one was medical clients that do not want any collection activity done on their accounts due to COVID. Other than just calling and asking, is it okay to resume? Do you have a different approach for this? Yeah, so one of the things that, you know, I'm a communication expert. Communication is what I love the most. So what I have found that works the best is we, um, especially early on, we created a, it was kind of a quasi newsletter. So what I mean by that is it wasn't really a newsletter, but we were sending a weekly update to the clients. Turns out they really appreciated it. One of the ways that we were proactive, because remember what I said, if you want to uh, keep that credibility with your clients, you know, it's going to be so important that they can see behind the curtain. And so what I was doing was I would send them out a weekly email and I was letting them know, first of all, what our COVID scripting was. So I shared with them, number one, what we were going to be saying to their consumers on the phone. And number two, I also let them know what kind of responses they were getting, you know, because I wanted them to see behind the curtain because when your, when your clients can see behind the curtain, they can feel so much more comfortable with using their services. Our clients felt safe and secure because we were staying in constant communication with them and we were letting them know what we're saying to the consumers, especially with hospital clients. Okay. You know, we did have, hospital clients that shut us down. And I just, I just kept on. I just communicated with them every week. I didn't worry about whether I got a response or not. I just let them know, here's what we're doing. Here's the scripting. You know, you can, you can, you can um, trust that we are paying attention to the responses that we're getting and we're adjusting ourselves accordingly. All right, great answer. And it may answer the second question, but I'll go ahead and pose it to you anyway. Um, my company is having issues with getting into contact with our clients via phone or email. How do you suggest getting, um, getting into contact with them without being overly aggressive? You know, I can see the similarity between this and the first question. And the thing is that I know how it can feel. It can make you feel uneasy because you don't know if that client is communicating with um, someone else, you know, it's like really hard to know what's going on behind their curtain, right? And so um, I think that you have to structure, if you're kind of sending out the same email over and over and over again, you need to structure the communication in a different way. So inviting them, you know, say, 
there's some regulatory things that have come up and we'd like to have a conversation with you about it. Or you could say, I've got great news. Our company just invested in, you know, what, like our company just invested in the collection advantage program. And we'd like to tell you about it and how it's going to keep your consumers safe. Um, so you could let them know that you want to discuss some possible changes with them, but give them a reason, right? Give them a reason to want to get on that phone with you. Um, sometimes too, you can accept like no good, no news is good news. If it's that, you know, this could get kind of complex where if you're feeling like they've shut you off and they're also not responding, I can understand why you would be concerned. So you could simply reach out to them and say, you know, is there a problem? Is there something that you need to be aware of? So thank you so much for that great question. All right, the last one under that, and this is really kind of more general, but how do you deal with negativity, people who draw you into their void or make you feel guilty? You know, um, what I have found is that the best way to do that is to avoid it altogether. So I'm not sure if a good question like this could be about anybody. You know, I feel like... I feel like when you can avoid triggering people and people are triggered now more than ever. So what I mean by trigger is that you have triggered something in their life that makes them want to um, get aggressive with you. So they're showing you negativity because something has triggered them. You know, at the end of the day, people are always just doing the best they can. But I'm gonna go right back to this scripting, okay? It's always like identifying what is the elephant in the room. So on this one, let's just like, I'm going to make up like a hypothetical situation. Um, a friend of mine on like this group coaching I do for communication over the weekend, uh, one of the people participants said that she was struggling with her husband because she's a massage therapist and she was unable to work due to COVID, which then put him in a position to be the major breadwinner. And she was freaking out because she felt like she didn't have her own disposable income. This was causing a lot of friction in their very long-term marriage. Like I think they've been married for something like 30 years. Years, right? So you want to go right to that elephant in the room. Whatever is bothering that person, whatever is the, whatever is the source of the negativity, it's how are you feeling about dot, dot, dot. Okay. How are you feeling about our finances now that I'm not working? Okay. And then you psychological pause. So whatever is causing that person's negativity, how are you feeling about this situation, whatever it may be, okay? You have to just fill in the blank. So the, the script is, how are you feeling? Fill in the blank. And then you want a psychological pause. And, and this is where it takes deep listening skills. So what I mean by deep listening is you're going to listen and determine whether their response is filled with certainty like if this husband were to say, you know what, there's no problem at all. We, um, we have, I've planned well and we have a year in our emergency savings. So there is nothing to be worried about. That's an example of a certainty response. Uncertainty would look more like if this husband would say, you know, I'm really worried. Like, I don't know how I'm gonna make our mortgage payment two months from now. Once you've seen what the response is, then you can move right on with the validation. And the interesting thing about validation is it's equally as important to validate when someone has good news. So if somebody, like when he said, oh, you know, we're great. I've got, you know, one year emergency financing reserved, then you would say, oh my gosh, I'm so glad that you told me that. That is so exciting to hear you know, but it's kind of like uncovering that unknown source of where the negativity is coming from. Because believe it or not, nobody wakes up in the morning and thinks, gosh, I just want that person to have a terrible day today. So I'm going to treat them badly. Nobody does that. You know, everyone is doing the best they can. Thanks, Don, for that question. Sure. All right. We had um, another topic um, was what strategic communication needs are you trying to solve right now? And the first uh, question or comment that came in on that was um, trying to make my collectors feel more confident when they call the consumer. Yeah, because you know, a lot of them, um, I'm hearing a lot where 
if the consumer says to the collector, like, why are you calling me? Don't you know there's a pandemic? That can really make the, um, that can make the collector feel really bad. It can disarm them. It can be uh, very disorienting to, to the collector. So the best thing that I know that creates confidence is when you can create an environment of um, when collectors know what to say, when to say it, and how to say it their confidence will go through the roof. You know, one of the things I recommend is when you get this um, PDF that we're gonna send you about the Goldilocks zone, there's some, there's a T-chart on the third page and it's like, what are you gonna stop saying and what are you gonna start saying? But going through a little bit of a coaching exercise with collectors can really help them increase their confidence. Also, you know, sharing with them what is the expectation. So what is your company's highest expectation? For example, is it better for them to get no complaints because you don't want the client to turn your services off? Or is it better for them to get the money? And like really role play it out. If you role play it out, and especially like the scripting suggestions, when they know what to say, because remember what I told you, the, the, the number three fear for collectors is not knowing what to say. That is what drives their confidence down. You need to build the confidence up by giving them the powerful words that are going to always move the company or move the conversation forward. That is a great question and something that, especially as we're like trying to recruit new collectors, we need to let them know what their job is going to be like. All right, great job, Mary. Um, the second uh, strategic communication that they're trying to solve was how to be empathetic enough to make more revenue. I think the first part of that is understanding the difference between like what is sympathy and what is empathy because you don't want your collectors to get into that position where they're just being passive all the time because passivity equals the friend zone. Once you're in the friend zone, it's really difficult to get the money. So being empathetic enough, that's a great question. It's a great way to put it. It's like, where is that sweet spot? The, the Goldilocks zone of empathy. It's really using the validation statement, eliminating the negative, the negative language. You know, negative language only serves to make people feel bad it triggers their nervous system to have a fight or flight reaction. And the next thing you know, now you're in the conflict zone and you're not gonna get any money in the conflict zone. And what's even worse is you're gonna get a complaint when you're in the conflict zone. So the way that you do it is you say that validation statement. Now you've eliminated negative language. So you're gonna follow it up with a positive seed of happiness because a positive seed of happiness it's just a reassurance to the consumer. You know, think about it. Like I was giving a speech once at our local like municipality um, here in our town and a woman in the audience, she raised her hand, like right in the middle of the speech. Okay. She raised her hand and she goes, what do you want me to say? You have good news. I have good news for you. You have a speeding ticket. And I said, um, yeah, actually tell me something that's good news. Like what is the best thing that can happen as a result of them getting the speeding ticket? And she said to me, well, you know, we have this app and if they download this app, they can avoid getting speeding tickets in the future. So how do you like, you know, how do you, it's, it's the way you flip the script. I call it flipping the script. You turn a negative into a positive, you know, I understand it's frustrating to have a speeding ticket. Nobody calls here and is excited because they have to pay money over their parking or a parking ticket. Sorry, it wasn't a speeding ticket. Um, the good news is we now have an app. And if you use this app, you can feed your meter from inside the restaurant and you can avoid ever getting a speeding ticket again. You know, sometimes in a collection situation, we might say something like, um, would you like to take this opportunity to take care of this account prior to it going on your credit report? So it's really just in the way that you use your words. Thank you for the question. All right, um, this one's a good one. How can you be assertive yet respectful towards people who are afraid. One of the things that 
I think is so important, especially now and especially in our industry, more than any other industry, is understanding that there are six human fears, okay? And the number one human fear is the fear of poverty, believe it or not. And so when we can understand up front that just the fact that having a debt can um, triggers those consumer fears, it's really um, about using the steps that I gave you. First of all, you need to um, remember that remember that they're going through something, okay? Their situation is challenging for them. Matthew Lieberman, who is a neuroscientist at UCLA, and he's written several books. He's one of my favorite neuroscientists. And he says that the um, research shows labeling an emotion instantly makes people feel better about that emotion. So fear is an emotion. So if you can say, you know, to a consumer, I can understand that your situation is very challenging. What you have done inside the brain, because this is all about what either stress chemicals or happiness chemicals are being created. So when a consumer is stuck in that fear state, that emotion of fear, then what's happening is they have a lot of cortisol and adrenaline that is being pumped into their system. And that makes them want to freak out on you, right? So what we can do by labeling the emotion or say to them when we acknowledge what their situation is, okay? We don't wanna just always avoid the elephant in the room. We wanna to go towards the elephant in the room because it's that level of courage and vulnerability when you can say to the consumer, you know, how are you feeling about your finances? It's okay. A lot of people are in the same situation you are. You are not alone. The bottom line is we can bring humanity back into this process of collections and and that is my main message always, okay? So I hope that that helps. All right, and we had one more topic and it was about what impact are you looking to make with regards to how you communicate with your clients or with your collectors? Um, two comments or uh, questions came in and they really kind of can be rolled together. One, um, boost collector totals and gain further trust from clients. And the other one was just more revenue. Yeah, that's what I always want too, right? <laughs> Who doesn't want that? So, you know, I think that now is the time to really step back, examine those phone calls. You know, if you're using voice analytics, put some of the stuff that you learned today into the voice analytics, work on training your clients. One of the things that we've done is um, to, to really boost collector totals is to pay attention to those strategies and be proactive. You know, remember what I said at the beginning that in order to establish credibility in the new normal, I think we want to be working on our strategies. You know, strategies from 2019 may not work. We need new strategies for evolving times. And so when you look at each piece of the communication and determine by listening to those phone calls, is it moving the call forward? or is it moving the call backward? And you guys all know that what I'm talking about, if the consumer and the collector are wasting time, you know, like arguing about things, that is, that just needs to be eliminated completely. And the way you eliminate that is you need to train your collectors on what to say, when to say it, and how to say it. Okay. And as far as further trust from your clients, like I said, I have never, ever had a reaction like that. When I pulled out this manual, I've, it, true story, I have never gotten a hospital client in one meeting, one meeting. Okay. And I got them at a higher commission and it's because I showed them, this is how we train our collectors. We are keeping you safe. You are not going to get complaints from our company and also back it up with actual proof. The thing about, the thing about this whole thing, right, is to understand that fear drives escape and hope drives positive action. So when you can understand what are the fears of your clients, how are you feeling about your accounts and collections? You know, how are you feeling? Dot, dot, dot. Let them speak. They're either going to respond with certainty or uncertainty. But it's the way we open up those conversations to go to those deep levels where we can look behind the curtain and really know what's going on with our clients. My clients trust me 
explicitly. And I know that because number one, they're willing to have the conversation with me. Number two, they are willing to keep their collections turned back on because why? Because I can prove it. Okay. I can prove it with science. I can prove it with our call results and they don't get complaints. And so before COVID ever happened, they weren't getting complaints from us, which means they feel even safer using our services now because they can feel confident that we are giving them that white glove experience. That is a very great question. Whoever sent that in. All right. That wraps up all the questions that we had. Did you have any last thoughts that you want to go over before we end the, the webinar, Mary? I just want to thank everyone for, for being here. If we are not already connected on LinkedIn, please reach out to me on LinkedIn. Either send me a message or a connection request. I hope that you enjoy your handout, the Goldilocks Zone of Connection. I think that you'll find it very useful, maybe for a team meeting. And uh, just reach out to me if you ever want to talk about training, because I am happy to help. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Mary. We appreciate your time today. I appreciate you, Dawn, too. I just want to tell you one more time how much I uh, really enjoy working with you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining today. Have a great day.